you all so much for coming. It's my pleasure to introduce our very special guest, Ira Glass. So as I'm sure you know, Ira is the award-winning host and executive producer of the documentary radio program, This American Life, produced by Chicago Public Media and distributed by Public Radio International. The program began in 1995 and is now heard on over 500 public radio stations each week by more than 3 million people and is downloaded as a podcast more than 900,000 times weekly. So Ira, thanks for joining us. Glad um, to be here. I want to start off with some basic questions about the show. Okay. Where do you get the ideas for the show? What comes first, the theme or the stories? I mean, I get asked this a lot. I mean, generally, generally what will happen is someone will pitch a story um, which we just love as a staff. Like every, every two weeks we, we, try, we, we, we have a meeting where we generate new story ideas and then people are always looking for mm -hmm. stories. And, and so somebody will pitch a story that we just all feel very excited about and that doesn't go with any of the themes that we have going on at the time. And so we'll just basically say, look, let's do that story as the anchor for some new show. Mm -hmm. And then we'll concoct a theme that could plausibly contain it. <laughs> Um, and sometimes we'll come up with two or three different themes that could plausibly contain it, and then we'll look on a list of like, oh, here's some stories that are left over from other shows that we never used, and see if we could glue anything to it, and then we'll start on a search. And then that search can take us between three or four months wow. often, and, and sometimes even more. And, 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 and it's a very, like, finding ideas for stories is generally, for us and I think for anybody, um, inefficient like 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 I, th I think one of the things when you start to do creative work that nobody really talks to you about is like well where are ideas going to mm -hmm. come from and you have this idea of like oh they're going to be like sprinkled on your head like yeah. fairy dust and maybe this is it, true in engineering and other kinds of work too but like and where ideas come from is just you have, you have to kind of just surround yourself with a lot of stuff and a lot of ideas because ideas lead to other ideas and so at some point we'll just go on a massive search which will include um, Googling, um, and, uh, uh, but uh, you know, also just doing all kinds of research. We'll brainstorm different kinds of things that could possibly fit in the theme. Often we're in a situation where we'll have a very serious story that'll be the anchor with a lot of weight and a lot of stakes. And so we'll just consciously be looking for something funnier or lighter or more personal or smaller, just, just something like, like that'll just be, um, so the whole episode won't be so heavy. And, um, and, and for us to find three or four stories that'll end up on the air, often we'll, we'll look at 15 or 20, 25 different story ideas. And we'll go into production often on, on seven or eight stories. And then we just have to start making them and you know, commissioning writers and flying people around the country and, and interviewing people. And then, and then we kill a tremendous amount of material. Like, like it just was built into our production model from the beginning that we'd be killing between a third and a half of everything we start. It's, and it's sort of like for, for this kind of stories we're doing where we need, um, we need them to be relatable, we need a strong character, at least, at least one, and if not more than one. We need there to be a plot. The plot has to be surprising. It has to lead to some new thought about the world. That thought has to be surprising. It's like it's a lot of criteria to have going. And, and you really can't tell what's going to work until you start to make the thing. And, and so it's, it's sort of like you need, you, you want, it's like you want lightning to strike as an industrial product like every week. And to do that, you just have to wander around in the rain a lot. <laughs> so learning how much you record and how little of it actually gets onto the show was pretty surprising to me. What else, does, what else surprises because people? Because in your view, we just open up the mic, and people yeah. are incredibly charming. Yes. You just <laughs> yeah, say, if only. I think somebody comes up to you at a dinner party and says, Ira, I have this great story. And then you say, let's record it right now. And then suddenly <laughs> it's on the radio that week. That would be a dream. Yeah. <laughs> My job would be very easy. So what else usually surprises people about the production of the show? I mean, it's a lot of us now. Like, it, like when we started the show, it was just three people and me, and now it's a, it's a dozen of us making it. I mean, I don't know what would be surprising to people. I, th I think I think radio, like 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 with movies, like when you see a movie, you can just feel all the money and all the people mm -hmm. behind it. Whereas a radio show, if it's working, it just feels like one person talking to another person, mm -hmm. and so the machinery of it is invisible. And 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 if it's done well, you don't get the feeling that we've spent four months, you know, like editing and re-editing and re-editing and, and going back and doing things again. So I think, I think in general, the machinery of it is, is surprising. What about the interviews? Do you do them face-to-face? -face? Some, but it doesn't have to be face-to-face. -face. 
mean, it's funny with radio, like, like I'll do interviews where, where it'll just be over, over, you know, I'll be in a studio in one city and somebody mm -hmm. will be over in a studio in another city. Um, and, and like we use the incredibly primitive technology of I'll be in a studio and talking to them over the phone and we'll send an engineer who'll just sit there with a microphone. So I'm recording my voice where I am and they record their voice on a recorder where they are and then we just synchronize the two tapes so it sounds like we're in the same room. Very complicated. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and it turns out like that's actually, for many things, like that's just as good as being there in person. Like it doesn't matter if you're there for a lot of things, even for very personal things. Because it's almost like we're used to talking to people on the phone very yeah. personally. And, uh, and, and, and it's almost like the, the conversation is happening in the space of radio, if that makes sense. And I know that some interviewers, like Terry Gross, who does Fresh Air, she prefers not to be in the studio with the people. She doesn't want to see them. She doesn't want them to see her like going through her notes. Yeah. You know? Cool. So. so I'd love to hear you talk about some of your favorite episodes. I know Testosterone, I think, is one of them, and Harper yeah. High. What do you think makes those so successful? I mean, those are such different episodes. I mean, the, the episodes that are good um, like have a really nice mix of being relatable and surprising and take you into a world that you don't, I feel like the very best episodes take you into a world that you kind of know exists but don't really know the details of. Um, like Harper High School was this, it was a two episode thing, we'd never done that before. And, and basically it came out of our senior producer, Julie Snyder, being, being really interested in trying to figure out a way to cover um, gun violence in mm -hmm. Chicago, and, and uh, last year, 506 people, I think it was, were shot in one year in Chicago. And the number was going up, whereas the number was going down or staying the same in other big cities. And, uh, and it was very unclear why the number was so high in Chicago. 506 is, is a really, like, it's a huge number. Like New York is three times larger than Chicago, and the number of shootings in New York was smaller than that. And, uh, and, and in the coverage of it, it was really hard to even understand the most basic things like why are people shooting each other? Like you would read in the clippings, like so if somebody got shot at the corner of 70th and Stony Island and you wouldn't know like, what is it a drug thing? Was it a gang thing? Was it a domestic thing? Like you couldn't even know. And so we were looking for a way to, to get a grip on it. And, um, and, and you know, like if you're, if, you're, if you're us, like the first thing we need is plot and story and characters. And so we have to find a place to locate the story. And the first thing we tried was, um, was uh, on Memorial Day of that year, 50 people were shot in w one weekend, in the Memorial Day weekend. And we thought, wow. like, OK, that, that'll be our frame. We'll just do Memorial Day weekend. And uh, we'll do those 50 murders, uh, or those 50 shootings. And that turned out to be almost un it turned out to be unproducible in the time frame we were going to do because once the people were caught up in the court system, we couldn't get people to talk to us, mm -hmm. and we couldn't report out the stories and with the kind of speed that you'd want to to get it on the air. And then we went looking for another frame, and we found this high school, Harper High School, where 29 kids had been shot in one year. Um, and I can't remember if it's nine, and they were current or recent students. So it's recent students are sort of like a kid who dropped out as a sophomore, but now he would have been in his junior year and still friends with everybody in the school. Like, we were counting those, because the school counted them. Um, so it was 29 uh, current and recent students, and eight or nine of them died in one year. And so it's, and if you just think about, like, the trauma a school goes through if there's one shooting, and so this is 29 of them. And this was not, like, it wasn't the most shootings in Chicago or anything. And I think what makes an episode like that work is that, I mean, honestly, like most of us have no idea what it's like to, to, to live in a community where that many people are getting shot. And as reporters, like we sent in three reporters for five months to just camp out in that school and get to know uh, the, the staff and the students. And, uh, and, and what was interesting was both being able to document like what that level of violence does to the kids in, in, with a kind of detail that you don't get to report out that much. And so, you know, you, you, there was one kid who had just been at, he was like, the, like, he was like the Forrest Gump of the shootings at the school. He had been at like six or seven different shootings. Yeah. Like, in, you know, like kids like who he knew was close to, like he would just be standing there, like they would die right in front of him. And his own brother had been shot three times and survived, uh, though he was in a wheelchair at the end of the, the last shooting. And just like, like that kid, like where that kid is after that, it, it turns out to be something worth, worth talking about. And, and, then, and, then, and then the staff of the school was really great, kind of the crypto 
the crypto message of the show, I guess, was like, here's like an inner city high school, and people bring all these associations to that, yeah. and the super competent staff. Um, and when there was a shooting, they had all these procedures that they had developed, you know, learning from the army, these after action reports, yeah. where they would just jump into action to figure out, okay, if this kid got shot, who else did this kid know? What gang were they in? What gang is warring with that gang? And they would just get all the other kids who could possibly get shot out of the school um, and to their homes so that, like, to get people to safety. And I just, like, so much about that show was really surprising. Um, so, so that that made that work. Get, like, gang, gang, I could talk about this show for a long yeah. time. <laughs> like, gangs in that school turned out to be really different. It made me feel like such an old person. Like, the gangs, when I was a reporter in Chicago reporting on gangs 15, 20 years ago, like, gangs were like a criminal enterprise, like you'd see on The Wire, and they'd sell drugs, and they were out to make money. And I just felt like, well, these kids today, they don't even want to make money. <laughs> like, they're not even selling drugs. You know, like, <laughs> and like, and the parents are sort of like what I was. Like, they, they thought a street gang was like one thing. Mm -hmm. And in fact, like, all these gangs are, is just like, it's like, picture your, your, I mean, if you heard the show, it's like your high school yeah. clique. And it's just like a bunch of kids. You know, but everybody can get a gun, like you know, like and and so it's just like basically to, the da neighborhood is so dangerous. Every kid in the school was in a gang, and uh, like the nerds were in the gangs, the drama kids were in the gangs, like like the the band kids were in the gang. Like every kid, you had to be in a gang to like, every kid was in the gang, and so and so you know you'd read about like oh you know this fifteen year old that summer got shot. You know, and you'd read like in the paper, oh, she was a member of a gang. Every kid is in the gang. Like, like she was a band kid. You know, and uh, anyway, yeah, and and so and so 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 a lot about it was surprising, and and I feel like that's what makes it good. Like, like there were characters who, when you would hear their situation, like on the radio, it's so easy to like the secret power of the radio or the special power of doing something on the radio. Is the fact that you don't see them, and so you don't, you don't, you. It's like it's like it's easy to create the kind of intimacy where you feel like you can, you can get to know people very, very quickly, and and like we did a TV show for two years, and and we we done we done two movies, and and I feel like you can create that kind of intimacy, you know, on film and and but or on video, but you'd really have to shoot it like a film, like you'd have to light it beautifully, and you'd have to like really frame it beautifully. And just like to bring the kind of production values that you'd have to bring to it to make those stories work with the sort of immediacy and emotional intimacy that you get on radio, like you'd have to you'd have to really throw a tremendous amount of money and I don't know production value into it. Like it really would have to be shot like a film. And whereas with us, you know, like we're going out with tape recorders, and just the fact that you don't see the people and you hear their voice, that has such an immediacy to it that I feel like that's the special power that radio can bring to something like that. And, and you just feel like you get to know the people so fast. Um, and you're so close up in their world that it's easy to imagine, here's what it would be like to be them. And I feel like, I mean, this is a really long answer to your question. Right. But, like, I feel like, <laughs> but I feel like the, you know, the, thing, the thing that we can contribute as, as reporters in the world that, that is harder to achieve in other, that, than other kinds of journalism is, is that. Like that is to do like the most basic thing that a story can do, which is make it possible to imagine, oh, here's here's what it would be like to be you, you know. And I, and, and I feel like it's something like that where you're talking about gang kids and things like that, where mm -hmm. I think people who are not in a gang or didn't grow up in that kind of neighborhood bring all mm -hmm. kinds of associations to it to be able to illustrate. No, no, no. Here's what it's really like. If you go to this neighborhood, you would be in the gang. Here's how you would feel, and here's who you would be. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, that's that's. That's what we're trying. Thank you. Oh my God, that was so no, easy. Too long. <laughs> I will be more terse as we go on. So when I heard that episode, I thought it was very affecting. And you leave the episode and you say, "What can I do to help?" And I think there was some sort of donation for Harp. Was there on the website? I mean, there, you know, the school set up a donation page, and they made a quarter million dollars. And if anybody like wants to go, they yeah. can use the money. They're a public school. Um, but but like you know what can you do to help? Right. Like there's nothing you can do to help. Like like you know like like there's nothing you can yeah. do. I, like I honestly believe like there's no this. It wasn't the kind of thing where. I mean I mean maybe it's like cynical to say that, but like like if you, you're going to change the social structure of yeah. the south side of Chicago so that kids don't want to join gangs or make the neighborhood a safe mm -hmm. neighborhood, 
I mean, you know how you could help is if you could, ra if you could revive the economy mm -hmm. of that part of the city of Chicago so that the entire neighborhood became safer because the economic level would rise. I think that would be the thing. But you know, the fact is in our country, right. like, like where pockets of violence happen, it's, 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 it's very poor you know, pockets in cities and you know, unless you fix that. Right. Yeah, so. But with episodes, like very yes. tough love. Yes. Like, you made the story, I think, because you wanted to tell that story. Very but then, is about uh, yeah, it's about this judge. There was a judge down in Georgia who yeah, the judge covered. Amanda Williams yes. was in Georgia, and there was an episode about her drug court and some very strict rulings. And then after the episode aired, there were some real world consequences for her. Yes. So when you told that story, were you thinking in the back of your mind, like, what's Georgia going to do once this airs, or are you just telling it to tell an interesting story? I mean, it, it was first and foremost an interesting story. That story, like, like that story, man. <laughs> I was down in Georgia. We had this idea yeah. for a show called Georgia Rambler based on like an old newspaper column. And the idea is that this guy would like roll into different like small towns in Georgia. This columnist, uh, Charles Salter, used to like, he would just show up in a town and he would find a story that day about that town. It was just like portraits of small town life. And as a staff, we just thought like, oh, that'll be fun. Like, let's do that. And so we each chose a county. We'd just pick names out of a hat. Yeah. And so I ended up with, with the county that, that, uh, that turned out to be the county that this judge was in. And you know, you're given one day to find a story under these rules that we artificially created for ourselves just to amuse ourselves. And I had been in the county, like literally the first interview I did was somebody was like, you know who you should talk to is this guy, Joe Iannicelli, and he's in this war with this judge. And, uh, and, uh, and I heard about the judge right away, and then people kept telling me stories about the judge. And I totally had this feeling of like, if these stories are true, somebody's really got to, like, somebody should really investigate this judge. <laughs> <laughs> and I totally had the feeling of like, some reporter should come down here. <laughs> and like, and then, like, and and honestly, like when people would tell me the stories, I couldn't tell if the stories were true. Like, I was like, this. I really had a feeling of like this can't be true. And then pinning it down and getting people to go on the record took four or five months. Like it was just, and every time I would fly back down there, my wife and my staff were just like, "Why are you doing this story?" And um, and and then it turned out like people were willing to come forward and go on the record. And and I did have a feeling in the back of my mind like, well, somebody should do something about this if this is true. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and I don't feel like I can claim credit. At the same time that like, people were saying things to me, they were saying things to, there's a, there's a, a watchdog you know, state committee that looks for judges who might be doing things that are bad. And they kind of had been tipped off about this judge. And they were looking into it too. But I think the visibility of the radio show and the fact that people from all over the country heard it gave it a, a visibility in in Georgia, and then and then and honestly, like hearing it on the radio, like like uh, like a, a woman who had been on the state supreme court got involved in the case as one of the people moving the case forward, and and like it, it became it raised the profile of it in a way that that is very rare. Like honestly, like like most journalism, like doesn't achieve anything. Like like like, and I and I think like like I got into journalism. Like like most young people thinking like I'm gonna like I'm gonna make the world a better place by exposing wrongdoing, but but honestly like most wrongdoing that you expose nothing happens, you know just like you know like you can do all the stories you want on Guantanamo and you know just the things that 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 somebody should get in there and fix climate change, you know like everybody who who is gonna believe that climate change is real pretty much believes it, and yet we're not actually addressing the problem in a way that, that is at the scale of the problem itself. And you know, I just feel like, well, what is the left to say as a reporter? Like, it's happening. There's more and more evidence all the time. We can say it again, but you already know it. And, and, you know, like, and, so, and so generally, like, when you're a reporter, almost nothing gets any results ever. Like, that's one of the very few times I've ever worked on anything that I could say afterwards, like, I helped in any way the process of something changing. What about people's individual lives? Do so they follow up with you and say, after I was on the show, this happened? <laughs> after I was on the show, a lot of my friends got in contact with me over Twitter. <laughs> Real world change. Real world change. Yeah. Um, I mean, some, sometimes. I mean, sometimes. I mean, the, you, usually the stories we're doing are such, like, usually, uh, you know, often we're just documenting people's personal right. stories. And, um, and, uh, 
you know, and I don't know how much, I mean, I don't know. I, 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 it's like funny. Maybe they would get back in touch with you and say, hey, Ira, you know, I was really having a problem with that. Now it worked out or just want to let you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, not that often. Okay. No, no, no. Like, I, no, I told that story about my mom, and she heard it, and now she's mad at me. No, there's a little bit of that. <laughs> what about episodes that just flopped or made you uncomfortable, or maybe listening back to some old ones, you feel like you didn't cover them in the way you would now? I mean, there definitely, there definitely are things. There definitely, yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, I mean, we're on a lot. We make a lot of episodes. Yeah. Like, and, you know, and there are things definitely that, that, um, that I really wish we could have done better. Um, I wish I could think of an example very quickly for you of one that, there's one that we did like, like last week that, that on staff we wondered if we handled literally the structure of the show properly. And it was this one which, which was built around an idea that I loved. One of our producers, Sarah Koenig, her mom has seven rules on things you should never talk about. Mm -hmm. And like you should never talk about, um, you know, unless you're going through a, like a health crisis. Like you should never talk about like your health. Like oh, I have this problem in my shoulder. Or you should never talk about how, your dreams. Or you should never talk about how you slept last night. Or and number one on her list is the route you took to get there. Like nobody's interested. And so she has like seven stories. And we thought this is a really funny premise for the show. And and Sarah said, well, w well, what if we could prove you wrong? Like I work with a team of people. We you know we're very committed to make finding interesting stories on any subject. What if we can prove? that like, there can be stories on these seven subjects that can be interesting. And her mother's like, I don't believe you can do it. And then it was just like, very much like, OK. You know, <laughs> it's like the first scene of like, um, My Fair Lady. Like, I can take this woman with a Cockney accent and make her into a lady. You know, like, <laughs> you know, and like that's our mission. And so we set out as a staff to find seven stories that would totally be amazing stories of those seven subjects. And, and I feel like, it, and Sarah Koenig is just like such an amazing uh, interviewer and writer on the radio. And, um, and so, and so, and I feel like, I, I think, I, and somehow like when the show was done, all of us had the feeling of like, oh wait, did we format the show wrong? And this is like such a nerdy thing, but we keep coming back to the mom throughout the hour to check in of like, well, what'd you think of that one? And what'd you think of that one? And, and then we realized at the end of like, which seemed like since there's a drama of what is she gonna think of each story and is she gonna give the thumbs up, the thumbs down? But somehow weirdly, I think for listeners that lowered the stakes, do you guys hear this one? Was it a thumbs up or thumbs down episode? Thumbs up. How many of you were thumbs down on it, though? It's some thumbs down. Because like, the, the drama it doesn't play like, perfectly. And, like, and some of the steppers, I was very much on the side of like, we must have the mom in the studio. Because the drama is, is the mom going to give us thumbs up or thumbs down? And we'll just do it like, we'll, we'll tell the stories to the mom. And then there was a whole contingent on staff. Uh, who were just like, no, 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 like, it's going to be more entertaining not to have the mom there. And, and, and uh, I, w I wonder if we did the wrong thing. Like, I wonder if we should have done it. I wonder if it, like, it would have been better just to like, just come back to the mom at the end and just let her say, like, nope, I'm still right. You know? <laughs> like, what you did know. she say about the episode? Uh, she, uh, she, she enjoyed it. Okay. Like, like, yeah, and she's still talking to Sarah, which was our goal. Okay. So. Well done. Yeah. So one thing that I was wondering, I read an interview you did with New York Magazine, and you gave some snarky responses. <laughs> And then some of your fans left angry comments on the article because you didn't match their expectations of Wait, Ira. What were my snarky responses? <laughs> what did I say? I'll send you the link. I don't even remember those. OK. And you know you didn't match what, who they think Ira Glass is, host of This American Life. Wow, I'm so glad I didn't read these comments. <laughs> OK, well, let's see. So the hear question how. is. Well, wait, do you, like, really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you think that you match people's expectations of who you are. Are you the same person as your narrator self? Oh, that's, I, um, I'm not the same person as my narrator self. No, the, my, my, my narrator right. self is a much more edited down version of myself. Yeah. Like any normal person, right. when I go in public, there's a lot less cursing than in real life. That was part of the snark. What? That I, that I what is cursing? Yeah. What the fuck did I say? <laughs> 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 um.
I've been doing this whole, um, I've been going around doing this show with these dancers, with these modern dancers. Did you guys saw the dance show? So like, like, right, like, it's, it sounds like it should be awful, but it's fine, right? It's good. Yeah, like, and, like so as yeah. I tell radio stories and these two incredibly talented women like dance and it sounds like, really, it sounds like it would be terrible, but it's actually very moving and, um, <laughs> and funny. And there's a whole section of the show where like the where I tell a bunch of stories, all of which include the word cocksucker, and I was so aware of like people in the audience of like, okay, you came out to the public radio event. And here I am, it's just like cocksucker this and cocksucker that. <laughs> so. Anyway, so what's the so my yeah. expectations are like you know people's expectations, like and I think on the radio like like. I think on the radio, like I'm, I'm listening to people in a more focused way, I've been told, than I do in my real life. <laughs> You're doing great right now. Thank you. Well, this is a focused sort of situation. Yeah. But like, you know, in, I had a friend who once said that the difference between me on the radio and, and me in real life is that in real life, I, well, on the radio, I'm just not distracted by the 500 other things I'm supposed to be doing at the same time, hmm. whereas in real life, I think I live in my own little head a lot. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. <laughs> Other people in my life, though, would contest that, <laughs> that thought that it makes a lot of sense and perhaps wish that it could be a little different. So you've sort of become this cultural icon. How does it feel when you see yourself portrayed in pop culture? Well, weirdly, like I'm not enough of, a, of an icon that people portray me without me being involved. Like, the, the, <laughs> like you no, no, you on mean the OC? I feel like you were. Oh, on the OC, that one, the yeah. OC that was a really special one. Yeah. Yeah, but but like. Well, you tell that story. I love that story. Yes. Okay. So I was like a super fan of the OC, and my wife and I would watch it every week, and um, and. Uh, you would sing California? Yes, we would. No, no, like we were so into it that at the beginning of each, I've told this story on the radio, yeah. At the beginning of each episode, like we, my wife and I would sit on the couch and we would sing along with the, the song, you know, do, 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 do. I know it. Yeah, okay. Got to end on the show, California, here we come. Right there, where we started from. California. Right, okay. So, um, and then, and then, and, and I guess I, I don't, and I think I had talked about how much I liked the show. I think that, that, that did, I don't think it was like a, ran, that would have been so random. But anyway. But it I, fits the character. It fits the character. So anyway, yeah. at some point, I actually have a clip of this. I didn't realize you were going to bring this up, but I, have, I brought a thing with like clips that sometimes, sure. I'm not, I'll just tell the story. Anyway, <laughs> so, so I was watching the OC, and, um, and, uh, and, and there comes a point where like Seth and Summer are in a scene, and, and I think there's like another girl in his room, that like blondie girl was in his room, and his girlfriend Summer picks up, and she's like, I hear a woman's voice, and he says like, and he comes up with the most impossible, he's like, oh, I've got the radio on, this American life is on the radio. <laughs> And then she says a line which is like, like, oh, that show with, hold on for a second, I am going to find it. <laughs> she says, um, an egghead thing. she <laughs> says, oh, that show of like, know-it-all hipster. <laughs> Isn't that pretentious show? It was like a Valentine from Summer, who I love, of course. Um, yeah. See if I, here we go. Here's Seth's question to her. Can we bring this up, bring up the sound from the computer? It sounded like a girl. Did it? But yeah. Well, sure. It, because I'm listening to the radio and this American life is on, and so it was a girl talking. First of all, that makes no sense at all, okay? <laughs> and then her reply, like. Is that that show by those hipster know it alls that talk about how fascinating ordinary people are? Oh, God. <laughs> Is that that show where hipster know-it-alls talk about how fascinating ordinary people are? Ugh. <laughs> so you were so just sweet. sitting on the couch with your wife and you, you saw I totally had a moment of like, wait, wait, what just happened? <laughs> what is happening? What is happening? A character on the Fox Network, no, on the, C on the WBs, yeah. just, uh, just talked to us. Yeah. Just somebody, yeah, like, yeah, that was crazy. That was crazy. That was really, yeah. it was crazy. Yeah, yeah, that was really, I was just like, is this on everyone's TV or is this, <laughs> like I really had a feeling of yeah. like, am I on some drug flashback right now that like, it really was like really, really weird. Yeah. That was, that's one of the weirdest things that's <laughs> happened for sure. But you chose not to be on Orange is the New Black. Yes. Right. 
How, why, why not? I, I didn't want to be myself on, a, on another TV show. Yeah. <laughs> like I had done a, I don't know, I felt like it was becoming a shtick of going on TV shows mm -hmm. and playing myself a little bit. I mean, this seems like a bratty thing the, to say. No, I think it got the same message across. It didn't need to be you. Like, as soon as I watched it, I paused it. I Googled, was this supposed to be Ira Glass? <laughs> and then it said yes. And I was like, OK, I can continue watching. Yeah, yeah. So I, the message got across for your fans. Also, yeah. The, yeah, 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 that seemed fine. I, I wish them the best and do wish them the best. And it's good for the business that, we, that the show was sort of there in a weird crypto I, way. That, yeah. yeah. But I didn't want to do it. Like I, at that point, like, 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 yeah, yeah. I didn't want to do it. So shifting gears a bit, just to talk about technology, what's your favorite app or your favorite piece of technology? I mean, I, mean, I, I, I use a MacBook Air that I, that I think is amazing. Am I allowed to mention an Apple product mm -hmm. here? <laughs> um, I mean, I think, like, you know, I mean, I'm constantly amazed at the devices in my life. Um, uh, my friend uh, Chris Ware is this cartoonist and, and writer, and he says he feels like his iPhone is like the tricorder he wished he had had as a child watching Star Trek. Like it does all the things; it can tell you anything. And uh, but like my my technology use is pretty like like basically I'm editing on Pro Tools, I'm writing, I'm sending emails, I'm listening to music while I run, and I'm using Maps. So you don't have Snapchat. No. No, like, and also I'm not on Twitter. Like, I'm not, like, I, I feel like I don't need a creative outlet. I'm all set. <laughs> you know, like, like, I don't need a Tumblr. Like, I'm, I'm good. I'm covered. Like, I, I don't, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. Is there anything that you're waiting for, some piece of technology? It's like, why doesn't that exist yet? I have to say there was a piece of technology that, that I pitched people for years, and then Google invented. And I feel like I, we, we, our entire radio show runs on this piece of technology. And it's and it's uh, docs. It's it's oh. that that you can share a document. Like like I don't like. And I used to meet software engineers, and I would say, could you invent something so that, for the thing that we're doing on our show, like we're playing each other's stories, and then we like go over the scripts together. What you want is something so that somebody in another city can be looking at the document, and you guys are both typing in at the same time, and people at four or five different desks can all be on typing on making changes. I was like, well, that must be easy, <laughs> and like. And then, like, and I kept waiting for somebody to do it, and then you guys, then you guys did it, and like our whole show runs on Google Docs. Like, I, like, yeah. And well, I've if wanted... you think of anything else, this is the right room to ask for. Really? It. Yeah. Can I just say, in the calendar program on the iPhone, <laughs> it has two, what I consider bugs. Um, <laughs> it makes you. It's on your phone, and it makes you type in your name and tell it who you are every day, and so you'll be like riding a bike. Realizing you have to check your calendar and then you have to stop and enter into your name, that's that's not why. Why? It sounds you... like a pitch for glass. Really, for yeah, the glasses thing. Because it's like, oh, it would just pop right up. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. Okay, we'll we'll talk to someone on calendar. Anyway, so see yeah. What we can do. And then it keeps trying to ask me. It, it asks me every day, do I want it on my home screen? And it's mm -hmm. on my home screen. And there's no way to tell it. You're already living on my home screen. <laughs> Stop asking me. You live there now. <laughs> Look around. <laughs> You're on the home screen. I can't give you better placement. You have the <laughs> number one placement on the phone. You're like at the top of the phone. <laughs> Let me think if I have any other engineering problems I want to solve. Yeah. No, like, like, no. I feel like, I feel like, no. I'm, cool. Things have been amazing with technology. There's a lot of things wrong with this country and the world, but our computers and phones were doing great. <laughs> <laughs> also, cable TV, fine, <laughs> doing fine. Plenty of good TV to watch. Does any piece of technology scare you? I mean, no. <laughs> Wait, does That's any type of technology question. scare you? Yeah, when there's all these articles about um, privacy and people watching you and ubiquitous cameras. I didn't know if that was something that you worried about. No. I mean, I suppose if I should, but I don't. <laughs> I, I don't no. no. 
Like, okay. honestly, like, I'm so full of fear about other things. I can't <laughs> There's not enough organize my fear. No, it's true. Like, I feel like mm -hmm. I'm constantly on deadline. I'm constantly having to finish things which aren't finished. Like, right now, as I sit here, I actually should be going through tape about this car dealership so I could have a draft of my story by Monday, which is the deadline I have for myself. And here I am sitting here. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Yeah. <laughs> so like with all of that fear going yeah. through my system, like what, what time do I have to be thinking about mm -hmm. how I'm being surveilled by cameras all the time? Mm -hmm. Who will watch me making my mm -hmm. stupid fucking story? <laughs> like, do I care? <laughs> Go ahead, watch. <laughs> so since your radio show started in 1995, how has technology changed how you work? I mean, I mean, the basics since 95 haven't changed. I mean, when I started in radio, I was like editing reel to reel tape and mm -hmm. stuff. Like, I, you know, uh, and so I switched over from, from analog to digital, but that happened around 95, actually. Um, I mean, the main way that technology has changed the radio show is that, is that we can get it out to more people more efficiently. Like, like when in, you know, 10 years ago, Seth, when did we start doing the podcast? 2006. 2006. Okay, so 2006. Our audience on the radio, uh, Seth Lind, who runs the business side of the radio show. Very, very, very proud. <laughs> Seth will be up here. What's that? Our stock is up 3%. Our stock is up 3%. <laughs> um, so, so 2006, when we started the podcast, our audience on the radio was, was, was about 1.8 million people listening on 500 public radio stations, uh, which is kind of middle range for a public radio show, and uh, for a national show. And uh, like, like, like Morning Edition kicks our ass. Per Garrison Keillor kicks our ass. Um, but we still have an edge of a radio lab, thank God. Um, and uh, there's guys. Um, anyway, so, so and, and then over, over, you know, since then, basically what's happened is the radio audience has stayed at about the same level. Um, uh, it's gained a few, it's actually like, they it, it actually measure radio audiences more accurately now. So we know the number has been not 1.8, but it's been probably a little higher than that. And the radio audience has stayed there while we've gained basically a million people every week downloading uh, who we didn't have before. And, um, and that was a real question for radio that, that when podcasting and, and internet distribution would come in, how it would cannibalize radio. And I think in some parts of radio it's been very bad, mm -hmm. but for shows like ours, it's been really, really. Good, and that's, I mean, that's been the main way. And I think part of it is, part of the reason why we work on the internet is because accidentally the aesthetics of the show match the aesthetics of, of internet, of the internet. That is, I feel like, like most, most writing, most communication on the internet is very much like a very one-to-one -one kind of like, I'm talking to you, and even if it's a blog or like, you know, it, it's some, something else like that, like or comments or anything. It's like it's very much like I'm writing to you. You're right there on the other side of this thing, and I'm talking to you one on one. Mm -hmm. And radio is exactly that when it's done well. And so I feel like it just it has the feeling that it belongs there. Um, like we did nothing to market it or make it successful. It just kind of happened. So with the podcast, you can listen to one episode. You can listen to one act. You can pick and choose. Do you think that changes how people consume? The, your stories. I don't know. Like, like honestly, Seth would know better than this because he looks at the numbers. Mm -hmm. Like, do people listen to one story or do people listening to whole episodes? Oh, they do. They listen to whole episodes. Okay. Like, weirdly, like, there's a lot of it's figuring out how to do journalism on the internet. Mm -hmm. Like, like NPR and other other outfits have tried to figure out like ways to do it. And for a while, they thought people would be curating their own content mm -hmm. and that um, that you'd put out a lot of like small little pieces of journalism. And, um, and then people would like pick and choose from among them. But it turns out people don't want to go to the trouble, generally, uh, for audio anyway. Um, and, so, and, and, and one of the things that it seems like people will listen to is actually long form narrative. Um, and so, so, yeah, I guess they're listening for the whole hour. That's interesting to hear. But with the live stream, they're probably just tuning in at some point. The live stream is pretty new, though, so yeah. we don't know. That'll yeah. be interesting yeah. to see. Yeah, we have a 24 hour live stream now like a 24-hour radio station that only plays us, <laughs> which is like a dream that I never wanted. And <laughs> so are there any stories maybe about technology or otherwise that are just floating in your head that you've been trying to find a way to tell on the radio, but they don't fit into you know, a theme right now? Not about technology. I mean, honestly, like, like, like being here, I guess I could have prepared more by thinking more about technology and things like that. Like the only technology story 
truthfully that I've been interested in that, that we looked into that I still feel like I don't totally understand is why isn't, why isn't there an interesting engineering, like why isn't there like a, a kind of like a moonshot sort of um, engineering solution to climate change? Like why isn't that like a business for somebody to do to like take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere mm -hmm. and like fix the actual planet? Like so it seems like that's a good business for somebody who knows about have you looked like into that. it? Are people doing it? We've looked into it. You know, we've reported it out a little bit, and like there are efforts, and it's actually not like it's a it's a, it's not an easy technical problem to do to not consume more energy in the process than you know what I mean. You don't want to create more energy consumption than you're. You don't want to make the problem worse by right. solving the problem. So it turns out to be a, a like a not trivial problem, but it also seems like it isn't like a big war going on to solve that problem. You know, you don't, you know, it's just, it seems like it's a couple of people trying it and, and, and not at a huge scale either. It's what we found in Yeah, why reporting. don't you think people are more worried about it? I don't it? know enough about it to know. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't know. Like, I, I, I don't totally understand that. I feel like I'd have to report it out more. So, so if, there, if you had to choose one class for every student to take, what would it be? <laughs> wow. Um, the, the test class that they don't already take? Yeah, like, or maybe tweaking mm -hmm. the way something is done in classrooms or in education. I mean, there is a thing like in, in writing that, that I feel like I had to learn on my own that, that I surprised isn't taught in school. And that is, is that, that is people don't teach story structure properly in school. I, I think that when we're all taught how to write, um, like we're taught topic sentences, we're taught the, like the way that you would write like an essay with topic sentences at the beginning of paragraphs and you fill out the paragraphs and, and that basically was learning to write in school. Mm -hmm. um, but in fact, there's a structure of, um, of telling a story that's, that's more effective than that, that, that I feel like I had to learn by sort of reading and trial and error and whatever, which, which is much more anecdote based. Where, so for example, the, the stories on our show, the structure of them is, is really, Built around plot and ideas, and and it's a very old structure. Like it's a very like traditional kind of like story structure, where it's like you you want to just think through the sequence of actions where one thing leads to the next, leads to the next, leads to the next, and so and so really you want to break down whatever's going to happen into like this happened and then this happened and this happened and this happened. And the advantage of that of having forward motion is that it inherently creates suspense because you wonder what's going to happen next. And so you hold people's attention because simply moving forward action, it's like, it's like you create suspense and you can do it with the most banal story possible. Um, and, uh, but as long as, or as most everyday story, you know, like, and so as long as like one thing is leading to the next is leading to the next, you create suspense and then periodically you want to jump out of the action and have some thought about what the story means. And, and, and it's really like the structure of, it's a structure of a sermon. You know, like a sermon is basically composed of a series of anecdotes and then thoughts about what the anecdotes are. And it's, and it's, it's you know, certain writers just kind of naturally write that way. And radio is definitely works best that way. And there's a certain kind of journalism that works that way too. Like if you read like a really great narrative writer like Malcolm Gladwell or Michael Lewis, like they're constantly like giving you the action and jumping out of the action to make some thought and then back into the action. And, and that's the structure of Moneyball, and that's the structure of like a lot of really great books. And when we're in school, nobody tells us like, oh, that's a way to write that's so much easier actually in a certain way that, and it's so much more um, mesmerizing than, um, than, uh, than topic sentences, because you're utilizing this thing that's so primal within us because you can create suspense. Um, and I feel like the thing that we don't learn when we're learning to write in school is how to make it fascinating, you know? That's really interesting because in some of our meetings earlier, we were learning about how it's half technology and half the story because you need people to adopt and to understand and appreciate what you're building. And there's such a big push now for STEM and for all of these science and math-based educational initiatives. But it would be really interesting to also push stories because without those stories, how do you get people to, to appreciate technology? I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, stories are also an end in and of themselves, I yeah. would say. But yeah, no, I'm yeah. Like, if you have to justify it. But yes, yeah, I, yeah. I think it's an interesting point that we're taught to write in this very basic way, and there's a lot more art to it. Yeah, yeah. But I also think like you can learn to be a good writer. Like I like like I was a bad writer. Like I was bad, actively bad, and mm -hmm. um, and like I willed 
I willed myself to get better. Like, but, and you know, like, like, and, and really tried to learn like, what are the building blocks of a story? And I think, I think off, often people who aren't naturally good writers, you're just intimidated because you feel like, again, like you have to be touched by an angel to be a good writer. But, but you just have to have taste about what's interesting, I think. So what's your advice for someone who wants to become a better storyteller? Just start. Start making it. Like, don't don't wait. Don't wait for you. Know, like, you know, just start making stuff. Cool. Yeah. So now we'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. So there's a microphone right there. Hi. Thanks for coming. Uh, I wanted to follow up uh, on a question that Logan posed earlier, and I thought, sort of, uh, you addressed more from the technology perspective. But she'd asked how technology has changed the making of the show and the time that you've been working on it, and generally since you've been working in radio. And not just from the technological perspective, but I guess from the idea perspective, how has, I mean, I'm thinking about your, your comment about all the 500 things that are distracting you and keeping you from focusing on certain things. Does, does technology or that ability to kind of have that distraction take away the idle moments that you might have had to kind of brainstorm or think about something? And do you have self-imposed kind of free time from technology to, to help cope with that, if that's a problem? That's a really interesting question. No, not for me. Like, like my day is pretty much jam-packed with things that I organized for myself and obligations that I accidentally created for myself. <clears throat> and things that I thought, oh, that would be a really, a really fun little project. And then, of course, like, it ends up consuming like 90 hours a week. So, so, uh, so like, I, I don't have the problem where I feel like, you know, oh, I'm so distracted by my devices or anything like that. I, I don't have that. I don't have that at all. And I also don't believe that people's attention spans are getting shorter. I think it's such fucking horse shit. <laughs> like, I just think it's like the stupidest, like, I just think like, like, I feel like, I feel like the success of Radiolab and shows like ours and like the fact that like you can get people to listen to like an, people who are 14 years old to listen to like an hour long podcast. Um, and there's tons of them. You know, it's just like people will pay attention if something's kind of interesting. <laughs> you know, like I think like so. Would yeah. you characterize the, yourself and the people on your staff as people who are constantly like checking your phones and looking at your devices, or do you? No, I would not. No, like like I mean, maybe I don't know, Seth. Would you characterize the people on our staff as people? No, we're not. No, like we work in an office where like we have a computer in front of us all day long. So there's no reason to check a phone for anything, and. Uh, and uh, and we're old, like you know, <laughs> you know, people are in their thirties and forties. Cool. So. Thank you. Sure. All right. So one of my favorite shows is the Harper High School episode of uh, This American Life. I actually used to be a teacher on the South Side of Chicago, and oh, wow. was I, according you know along the which, lines of what you were talking about with the which school were you? The school elementary school I taught at was a Howe Elementary. is actually on the West Side, but also taught in Algale Gardens at. Uh, oh, Finger wow. at Finger High School. You taught at Finger High School. That was very. Were brief. you there when that kid got killed? So that was six. So for people who don't uh, uh, remember, uh, this was the kid who was beat to death with a two by four, uh, and it was captured on video. This was in the Algale Gardens neighborhood in Chicago, which is a very dangerous and isolated place of violence and poverty and depression. And so I taught there seven months after that happened. That was about right. three, four months after that. And so that personally was a a, a deeply affecting episode to me and. But sort of just even with the discussion that we're talking about today about, you know, what can we possibly do upon hearing that, you know, as a journalist, if you're reading about this in a newspaper, the newspaper is sort of obligated to present a balanced, neutral view of, you know, what's going on. Or, or yeah, yeah, it's not hopeful or it's not depressing. It's just this is what's happening. And so with your platform, do you feel sort of compelled to end the story in a certain, you know, hopeful tone or as bleak as it really is? Or do you feel some, you know, obligation to present it in a way that you feel is the best way to present it to the audience? And then um, as a second part of the question, with the, with the advent of, you know, podcasting and so on and so forth, with the amount of probably interviews that you guys did for the story, do you guys feel maybe that there's an opportunity to, you know, just place those on there and have people draw their own conclusions? Just, you know, we had an hour-long story. We could only fit so much in, but here's all this other stuff that we collected. Maybe if you go through and listen to it, you can draw your own conclusions. Have you guys given thought to that? And to the second thing, absolutely not. No. Okay. No. Like, I feel, I feel like it, it, it partly because... It's partly because, like, just hearing raw interviews without the context of, like, who is this kid and that's explaining, like, what is going on just feels like it's not doing the kids justice. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel like in the shows that we're doing, we're trying to present it in as compelling 
a way as possible and let people like have their own thoughts about sure. it. I mean, I don't feel like we're trying to like <laughs> preach like here's what you should think about this. Like right. I feel like if anything, Harper High School is an, an example of like most people have no idea what it's like in a neighborhood like that. Most people don't live in neighborhoods like that. And 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 to even g get across like here's what this feels like, here's what this is in a way that's three dimensional. Like that, like that in itself, we felt like that was going to be the new thing we were going to do. And we didn't have to prescribe anything. And truthfully, like we didn't, like I was saying before, like I don't know, like, like you know, if somebody's got some suggestions, you know what I mean? Like we would say to the principal, like, like what do you guys, you know, like we have a whole section of the story on, um, you know, like the money problems the school has and they were getting some extra money for a while and that money was all going away. And it looked like, in fact, they were going to be having to let go the two social workers in the school and um, because of budget cuts, mm -hmm. and 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 our hope was like, and now like that school got so much attention, right. like the the you know the protect oh, Michelle Obama's been there, and right. those kids have gone to the White House, and like there's a lot of attention on that one school. But of course, like Fanger is just as bad, yeah. and still, <laughs> yeah. and Fanger is being run by like an incredibly wonderful principal, and like a really you know like like it's, it, like people are trying to fix these schools. It's mm -hmm. not like. Um, so, so, so anyway, so no, we wouldn't put up the other material okay. on the web. Um, and, then, and then do we feel an obligation? To, we, like, I feel like, yes, we go into those shows with a real missionary sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's true of a lot of the things we do. <laughs> I mean, like some of the stories we do, we just do for fun, like the seven things that Sarah's mom doesn't think you should ever talk about. Like there's no, we don't really want to rid the world of people talking about what route they took to dinner. Like we don't care. You know, it just seemed funny. But like something like something like Harper or, or or the story with the judge or I mean honestly like probably a third of everything we do like there's a really like why why be a broadcaster if you can't like you know if you don't have the feeling of like somebody should talk about this and right. like let's talk about it. Okay. Um, uh, but are you expressing like a dissatisfaction with where it went? Because no. if you are, like that's okay. <laughs> no, no, I. Uh... As one, I actually was one of the kids that you discussed who was sort of grandfathered into. I was suspended twice from my middle school for being in a gang. It was really just a group of friends, but we engaged in gang like activity where we got together and beat people up. Like that was considered gang activity and stuff. And so, when the segment on the straight legs where they talk about kids as soon as they hit 15, if you're not in a gang, you either need to find one or they'll find one for you. And so, just sort of, you know, even if I had any any sort of critical thoughts about the way that the story was presented. The fact that the story was being told was more than enough for me because that was so far beyond what most cursory glances at the issue were doing. And so that's why I appreciate the show because as, as they said in the OC segment, it's making the ordinary lives, you know, seem amazing. I mean, yeah, it, and it might be told from the hipster elitist perspective, but at least... <laughs> <laughs> At least somebody is telling it. And so that, I mean, that alone, if that is considered progress, then so be it. You sort of just have to take, you know, One you have step. to take what's given. So I, I appreciate the work that you're doing, and please keep it up. Thanks. Okay. Hi. So um, you go to the gym every day? Uh, I'm, <laughs> that, that wasn't supposed to be funny. Um, uh, what do you listen to, if anything? Um, it's funny because I can't listen to podcasts. I used to listen to Terry Gross, but I feel like, like actually, I have to have music playing. And so, and so lately, um, I've been listening to uh, my nephew's band, Heart Sounds. Uh, I've been listening to. Uh, I just started listening to uh, uh, Taylor Swift and <laughs> Katy Perry, uh, and uh, What Does the Fox Say? <laughs> I actually. <laughs> But like, I want to add to my public speech a whole fact check about what does the fox say. Because <laughs> it doesn't say that song. That it, it's totally inaccurate, that song. <laughs> so, sure. <laughs> uh, my question is more similar to the previous question, uh, which is that a lot of your episodes seem to end on sort of a sobering or a sad note. Or the, I understand that you said you want to tell a surprising story with strong characters. Uh, but you also mentioned earlier that journalists can't do anything, and that it's hopeless. Uh, no, no, wait, 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 you're <laughs> overstating. It's, it's more like it's, it's rare for you to see direct consequences in the world of having put a story out there. Like, like that's, it's rare. Like right. it, but but it, in, uh, for the Harper School, for instance, you, you said, well, what can you do to change this? There's, well, that's there's something nothing. like, right, you'd have to change the economic structure of, of poor neighborhoods 
in Chicago to change that fundamentally, which is beyond most people's power. Right. So we'll, perhaps uh, if one ran a big multi-million-dollar company, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. I, I wish I ran a multi-million-dollar company. Mm -hmm. uh, but so, what would you say is the the purpose of the show? Then is it to effect a change, or is it for entertainment? Or if you admit that most people who are listening to this will drink their coffee, say, "Hmm, okay," and can't do anything about it, what? Why do you do it? Um, I think the show is an entertainment. I think it's an entertainment. Like I think, I think the show. I think that 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 one of the things that that was part of the idea of the show from the beginning is that you could do journalism and you could do public broadcasting that would have all the ideals of the very best journalism, but also be fundamentally an entertainment that you that you would listen because your feelings would get caught up and you get caught up in the characters and things like that. I mean, I and the staff we think of the show as entertainment. We think of it as we are in it to amuse ourselves, but because of the kind of people we are, that sort of amusement also involves, you know, like we're interested in things in the world and we want to know like what's going on in a neighborhood like like Englewood, you know, West Englewood. And and so but if we go into West Englewood, we're not gonna do it in like we're not trying to do it in like a sad, sacky kind of sad, corny way. Like we're trying to do it to like we want to be engaged in the people and the characters and the you know, I don't know, like, the show is an entertainment. Like, and I feel like to pretend that there's something else about it, I, I feel like it's enough to be an entertainment. Like, like, most things that try to be an entertainment don't succeed. You know, like, simply to achieve that is, is hard, so. Okay, thank you. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, my question is, do you think that besides location, there's anything distinctly American about the stories you tell? And also, do you know if you have listeners who are non-American? We do know we have listeners who are non-American because we have podcast numbers. Like, Seth, how much of our audience is overseas? Do you have a microphone? Yeah, okay. uh, about 10, 10 to 15 percent. OK. Yeah. Um, and do I think of the stories as particularly American? I think that like, the things in the stories, generally, if the stories are any good, there's a universal kind of quality to them that could be anywhere. But also, like, we happen to be Americans. Like, our tastes are American. The things that interest us are American. So I feel like it's kind of both things at the same time. Um, you recently rebroadcasted an episode, uh, an updated version of an older episode that I really love, uh, the Fiasco episode. Yes. And one of the segments in the Fiasco episode is a reporter talking about her Fiasco interview. Uh, and I was really curious if you ever had an, an interview or an experience producing the show that you would describe as a fiasco. And if so, what was it? Um, I haven't had anything as spectacular as that reporter who, in the middle of a very tense interview, like squirted coffee or iced tea or something out of her nose, <laughs> um, <laughs> bringing her interview to a stop and simultaneously winning over um, you know, the interviewee. So I, I don't have a, as dramatic a story as that to tell. Like, like a lot of things have gone really badly for me in interviews. Like when you do a lot of interviews, you make every mistake. But I, 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 don't, have a, I don't have an answer this to the level Anything of your question. particularly noteworthy, if not at the level of that kind of a fiasco? It's OK if you don't. Nothing comes to mind. It's a really good question, but I don't have an answer. No. OK. Well, thanks. Which is a, honestly like a, a real interviewing problem. Often the question is better than any answer that the interviewee comes up with. So my heart goes out to you <laughs> in your excellence and in my failure to rise to the excellence of your question. Yes. Hi. Um, I have two questions. Uh, do you have any like dream episodes or goals for like the next 10 years for the show? And then also, I was listening to the superhero Let me episode. answer that one first. Okay. Like, like, we, like, I'm constantly having dream episodes and ideas for things we want to do, but then we do them. Like, 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 like it's a kind of a rolling project, you know? And, uh, and like, I, I'm going to think if there's anything in particular and right this day, I, you know, no, nothing today. Like, I feel like, like the stuff that we want to do, like, we, we do, but I don't have anything right now. What, what else? And then after the superhero episode, would you choose flight or invisibility and why? I absolutely <laughs> would choose invisibility. I know myself very well. <laughs> and, like, you know, the kind of, like, crouching, lurking, <laughs> nobody can see me, I will watch you sort of situation I'm totally comfortable with. Cool. <laughs> Flying from place to place. I can buy a ticket on an airplane. So, yeah. The airplanes are so terrible. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? No, I, I don't feel that way at all. Have you had, ever had a really good story on an airplane? Um, 
No, because any really good story would involve like near death sort of whatever. <laughs> I'm happy to keep it the way it is. No, no, airplanes are amazing. I can't believe you're complaining about airplanes. That's a technology which is totally wonderful. <laughs> like, and you, you get on a object and it moves you really fast and super comfortable and nobody can reach you on the phone so far. You know, it's like, it's awesome. Every part of it is great. You must be in first class. What? You must be in first class. No, I am so not in first class. <laughs> Are you kidding? Coffee no, radio. like I spilled coffee on the car on the way over here and I didn't, you know, like that's the level that I'm at. Like, no, I, no, no. I can tell you one thing, like we are talking about starting another podcast. Like that's one of the things, like one dream for the show is that a bunch of us feel like we should start making more stuff and, and hopefully in the next year we'll be coming out with more podcasts. And one idea that we're really excited about is the idea that we would do a show that's exactly the opposite of our show and do it as a podcast. And instead of it being each week we choose a different theme, we would do the thing that journalism never does and every week we would go back to exactly the same story and give you the next chapter of it and let it unfold over time. And so we're hoping to roll that out in January, um, if all goes as planned. Um, we just started talking about it in the last week or two, so maybe it's not going to happen. But that's, I feel like it would be really exciting and, and hopefully the first of other, of other projects. That, that leads perfectly into my question. The first This American Life episode I remember listening to on the radio in high school was about undocumented immigrants who got caught up in jail for some minor offense and then were never able to get out because I didn't have proper documentation. Right. Um, I always wonder when I listen to these stories, what happens to these people five, 10 years down the road, or even a couple of months in some cases. Um, you just mentioned you might start a podcast where you follow up with the people in your previous stories. I'm sure that manpower is a factor. You only have so many editors and producers. Um, have you ever thought of maybe tapping into your your audience base and having maybe you know grassroots reporters follow up on these stories to give you more manpower to? No, we haven't. <laughs> no, because generally I feel like often the stories, like it's rare for there to be a story like that where there's people sitting in prison at the end of it and you wonder like, oh, when are they going to get out? What's going to happen? Like generally like the stories end. And, and I feel like in a very bratty way, I feel like there's nothing else to say. <laughs> And that's the end of the story. Like, you know Do your I mean? other like, producers and writers feel the same way? They feel uh, like, okay, we're done. I or... haven't pulled them. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, okay. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. I mean, I, I can tell you that when we do reruns, we do go back and we check with all the characters in the stories. And we do that because we've made the mistake once of, of rerunning like this, this story about this couple, and then it turned out like one of them had died. And we're just like, oh, no. And so then we're just, that was years and years ago. And we're just like, oh, so now we go back and we check on everybody. And so when, when we rerun that episode, if we ever do, we'll go back and we'll know what happened to them. Um, but you yourself could, you know, if you're so curious, you know, their names are in the stories. You can check it yourself if you, you know, I don't know why I'm putting this back on you. <laughs> I suppose if like, like, there's a, it's, a, it's like saying to, like at the New York Times, they don't go back to like everything in the archive and tell you here's what happened. I don't know. I'm reacting very defensively, which means you're probably right. <laughs> yes. Uh, so what's your one advice for improving storytelling skills? Are you, are you trying to do storytelling? Yeah. In what, in what kind of context? Well, I love storytelling, and I think you are the best I've heard so far. So I wanted to get one advice from you. See, but I'm not, like, in real life, I'm not a great storyteller. Like, I, I'm, I'm only really good on the radio. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm totally, I need production values for it to work. <laughs> so your advice is production value? Absolutely. <laughs> if you can just get a little music playing underneath as you talk. I mean, I mean, if you're talking about, are you talking about storytelling, like, in your everyday life? Uh, no, more in writing. In or, writing. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, honestly, like, like, you know, amusing yourself is really, help, you know, like obviously the most important part is you want to amuse yourself. Um, and, and uh, I mean, you know, the storytelling we do, like, you know, I feel like if you're showing your stuff to friends and they're honest with you about, like, what's working and what isn't, like, obviously, like, that's, that's a huge help. I don't think I have, like, super smart tips that I can impart in a second. Like, the things that I'm interested in, like, like do have the kind of structure that I'm saying where it's very plot-based. I feel like that just gives things an enormous power. That was a terrible answer. I'm so sorry. Okay. And on that note. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
Good. Okay. Good job. That was fun. That was great.